Great. Um, hi, I'm Josh Nyer for Files in Django, and I actually just made a Twitter account for all of you guys, but I left my phone at the Airbnb, so they've locked it because I didn't give them my phone. But it will be Quack Duck Hello, which was the first thing that came into my mind. Um, so this is Files in Django. Um, so just quickly about me and the talk. I've been using Django for a little while, 1.3. Um, getting in the custom user model was awesome, as I recall, as was uh, native migrations. Um, and just keeps getting better. So I maintain Django storages for the last couple of years. I gave a lightning talk about it. Um, I'll mention Django storages, but this talk is not about that. But I have a lot to say if you're interested. Um, so this talk will proceed in three parts. Uh, it's an overview of the file API um, provided by Django, static, media, storage, that sort of thing. Some options slash recommendations for deployment to production, and you know some caveats and things to be aware of. And uh, we're writing a storage backend. We'll actually be demo storage backend. Um, it's IPFS, which is quite exciting, and I just got it working. So hopefully it works here. Um, so let's go. Uh, so static and media files. Oh, sorry. Uh, part of the reason I, I'm giving this talk um, and it's on the beginner track is because I had a serious problem uh, knowing or understanding or grokking the difference between static and media files. There's all these settings. They're both files, you know, static root and static URL, media root and media URL. Why are there two? Um, and Django was one of the first pieces of programming I really, really got into four or five years ago. Um, so the basic uh, difference between them is quite straightforward. Static files are files that are everything else that power your application. You know, not everything, unfortunately, can be Python, if only. Um, but CSS, JavaScript, image files, um, and media files are, are files that are uploaded by the user. They come from, it's un untrusted content. Static files, you're, you're verifying, you know, it's de defined at collect static time. Media files, profile pictures, what have you. Um, so I think part of the reason that it was a little confusing for me, and I think for other people, because I have, I used to run an agency, and I've onboarded a lot of junior developers, and I've noticed uh, pretty consistent confusion, is they are both use the same storage API to store them, especially uh, for, for local, for um, development, and oftentimes for production. Um, but there is this very important distinction that has important security uh, concerns. Anytime you're dealing with untrusted input, it's bad. Um, so about static files. So static files really means the Contrib Static Files app, uh, which ships as the, it's, it's enabled by default when you do start project. Um, it's got a bunch of settings. These settings are, they all culminate in how collect static works. Um, so essentially what you're working with is you have your files in, in your static, uh, under static in, in your local development all your dependencies applications, you know, debug toolbar and, and whatever other admin and third party applications have static files that they're including. Um, and you need to include those or else you'll get links breakage. It, nothing will work. Um, so, so yeah, um, so it all comes together with collect static. Uh, essentially the static file storage executes all of your finders, looking through all your directories and placing them into static root. Static URL is just the endpoint that hits to tell Django that, hey, this is a static file. Um, if anyone was at the Wizgy talk uh, a point that, uh, yesterday, a point that was made continuously was you know, the way that static files are served in development automatically is through run server, which is also a static files management command. Uh, and it's, it's very insecure. It's never use it for production. Um, and it, it's nice because it just works automatically. So, that's static files. Media files. Media files has a whole lot more settings. Um, and this is largely because you're dealing with things that are coming in from the internet and there's things you want to control, things um, that are important to think about, you know, denial of service attacks, that sort of thing. Excuse me. So like I was saying, media root and media URL was confusing for me at first. They're analogous to static root and static URL in so much as Static root is where collect static places all of your static files at the end, and media root is where your media files end up. Um, these are different because you really don't want someone to upload a static a media file that has a path of your static file that will then get served to all of your users. Maybe someone uploads jQuery.js, and, 
and suddenly their JavaScript is executing in, in your context if there was a fallback. So there, it's enforced by the framework. These have to be different paths. They have to be different URLs. Um, for whatever reason, that it's not actually clear to me. This is something I add to, to every project. Um, it, taken from the documentation, which is, of course, fantastic, the best documentation I've ever seen in a software project, really. Um, and it adds serving of media files to your, using the same, same tool, same tooling, same view as static files um, to your development. And you can see it's wrapped in settings.debug because never use run server, especially never use run server for serving your uh, media files uh, in production. So the third major piece of this that unifies them is the storage API. And it's a pretty straightforward interface, hasn't really changed that much since 1.0 modulo, you know, the time zone awareness and a couple other things for max length names and, and such. Um, and the core ships with file system storage where, you know, when you're defining your media route, your static route, you see all of a sudden you upload a file all of a sudden off of your media route, you probably forgot to git ignore it and then you went back and added it to git ignore because you really don't want to upload your, you know, random cat photos that you're using for development, which I've done before. Um, so there's a fairly straightforward interface. Um, not all of it is required. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'll, I'm gonna demonstrate a bit or, or show a bit uh, a novel one, um, Django Storages, which is probably the most popular uh, package that uh, implements this interface for various backends. Basically is a wrapper around third party libraries that and this interface. Um, so generally speaking, files and core. I was actually not 100% sure where to place this slide, if it should go first or last. Um, but I, I think that it's kind of un unlikely. It's not super common to work with the file directly. Um, but what it actually is shipping you is a, a Django core files file, which is just a very thin wrapper that does things like content chunking. So usually this is the sort of thing that gets uploaded and you're working with, you're working with an image field or you know, field.file. You're actually working with a file, file, file. Um, <laughs> true story, that's in my template. Uh, so, and I just wanted to mention that you can specify which storage to use instead of default file storage. Default file storage is what controls where things, the storage that is uh, uploaded to images and, and file fields by default. Uh, there is one caveat I'll note, or one annoying bug, which is that I find that you don't want to use the same file storage in development and production. Um, and if you specify separate storages, maybe you need different ACLs or you need different headers or, or whatever it is, um, those get serialized into migrations lo uh, locally and that's usually not what you want for production. There's an open issue to um, turn call, uh, storage into a callable, so you could, you could pass your own callback function here. Um, which, would, which would solve that issue. Um, people have opened many, many issues on, on storages about this. Um, okay, so that was the API overview, and now I would like to talk static file serving. Um, so we definitely shouldn't use run server. It's been driven in a lot, it's a warning in the docs a lot. Uh, so so what, what, what is to be done, what's next? Um, and of course, we want all the nice things that enable our websites to be fast and performant, things like caching headers, things like um, hashed, hashed files, so they're, they're unique. Things like uh, gzip compression, um, minification, which plugs into collect static, actually. Like, you usually use something like compressor or whatever. If you have SAS, you want to transcode it to CSS and minify it. Um, so one option, which I think is totally valid, is to use a reverse proxy. Whatever you're using for your reverse proxy anyway, which Unicorn says you need a reverse proxy because it's vulnerable to slow loris, so you use a reverse proxy like Nginx um, to handle this for you. Uh, and there's, there's a, lot of goods about, a lot of good things to say about this. The main reason, not the main reason, one important reason you'd want, you want to do this um, is to reduce load on, on, on Django. Python is slow. Even though it's using send file, it's still running through Django, requests that could be better served, you know, answering, uh, doing LRM queries and looking up APIs and all sorts of context switching that Nginx is highly optimized for this. Um, cons, you need to have access to a set reverse proxy. I've deployed a lot of applications to Heroku, it's, it's popular. 
Um, and that's not, not really a thing that, that you have access to. I've also done a lot of work with AWS, and I've, I've, I've done Apache and, and, excuse me, Nginx for this. Um, it's, it's quite fiddly, and sort of best practices change. Uh, it's hard to get right, and easy to get wrong, which are definitely not the same thing. It's not gonna compromise your website, probably, but it'll get slower, and you won't really realize it, because you'll think, I, I configured it well. I'm done. Um, so there are other options. Another possibility um, is white noise, which is a fantastic package. It bursts onto the scene from my perspective two or three years ago. Before that, a lot of people used DJ static, and it was sort of, I think people probably used run server at some point, I'm not sure. But uh, white noise is, 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 you know, I, I was gonna list about a bunch of possibilities here, but I think sometimes choice is dangerous, and white noise just works. It's very easy to install. It ships with all the best practices, including gzip, Bratly, hash files, caching headers. It's pure Python. Uh, Bratly is a new compression algorithm from Google that's based on like a dictionary of common things for beating Huffman encoding for gzip. Um, and there's actually a open ticket uh, for Django to somehow integrate white noise into uh, core, which would be really great because right now it's you need to go third party and white noise is pure Python and just works. It's, it's quite nice. Um, so one of the drawbacks of this, of course, is you, you do end up hitting Python. You know, you do, it, white noise, it ships, it's Django middleware that sees the, you know, the, it starts with static, uh, static URL and, and returns the file. Um, so a common thing to do is, if your site is, is small and low traffic, then this is fine. It really, it's not that important. I think there's a lot of premature optimization about that. Um, and it, you know, white noise sets the right headers. So, but it's quite nice to put it behind a CDN, Content Distribution Network. So AWS has CloudFront, there's Akamai, there's a lot of them. Basically, they have servers everywhere that are closer to your users. They'll request, a, a request will come in for the file. If they don't have it, they'll grab it from your origin server, in this case, from Django, via white noise, and they'll cache it there at the, at the edge. So it's very fast, very nice, especially if you know, your servers are in Virginia and you have users in Hong Kong. Um, and one thing that's common, which I actually do not recommend at all, is serving static files out of S3. Uh, it's really common, people set, you know, they use S3 uh, storage from, from Django storages and they set the different location, locations and, and that's just what they do. It's, it's very brittle. Um, it's like you have to put your Amazon API key somewhere to, so you can actually you know, go ahead and deploy. Um, it doesn't, you need to keep some sort of manifest or else it'll, it'll upload the same files every time or it's making a lot of uh, exists API calls. Um, so I, I actually honestly think that if you're using a CDN with white noise, it, it'll just work better. That being said, for media files, you should definitely not use your own domain. Um, there's a big security risk. Uh, people can craft all sorts of fun, malicious content that you know, has the um, file extension of JPEG, but isn't JPEG, it's, it's some sort of flash, or who knows? <laughs> there's a million of these attacks. Um, Google put out a nice paper saying, you know, this is why we host content from a different domain. Um, and you'll see a lot of sites do this. You, know, you have example.com, then you have um, uh, static-example.com, but not static dot, because subdomains still can execute in the same security con uh, same context. What we're really re uh, relying on here is the same origin policy. Um, so this is the sort of thing where I think Django storage is, or similar S3 is perfect. Um, you still use a CDN because I have noticed that, or I think S3 is fine for, I've, I've worked on a bunch of sites that use our uh, heavy e-commerce and when you load a full page, S3 is really not meant to be a content serving platform. It's like a, in a fantastic object store, but for serving content, it's just, I don't know if they're doing IP throttling. There's a lot of, uh, it bottlenecks hard. Um, so then I put a CDN in front of my S3 bucket and it just, it works um, really nicely. Um, I will say I had a really, really, really fun bug with S3 and course headers and image tags and loading the same image via JavaScript. So you can ask me about that sometime. I had to call up my friend who works on Chrome. <laughs> cool. So now let's get to the fun, fun part. Yeah, fun. So um, like I said, I maintain Django storages. It's a bunch of backends, Azure, SFTP, whatever. Um, so I thought, let's write a storage backend. That was way too ambitious because I just banged that out in the last two hours and I barely got it done. 
But um, so IPFS is the interplanetary file system. I love the name. The, lame, the name alone would mean I'd do this. But um, you know, it's a distributed peer-to-peer -peer content addressable version of mutable storage. Um, every buzzword imaginable. Um, if you saw the file coin, initial coin offering, this is these guys. Um, so I just wanted to show off very quickly, and then I'll take questions, uh, what it looks like. So let's see. So here I am running an IPFS daemon, and I quickly threw together a demo, which has very standard. Yeah. Which has very standard model. I think that every everyone should have this model at least maybe hidden and not admin accessible. Um, and I wrote, uh, please do not use this anywhere. <laughs> I wrote, I wrote what must be one of the most insecure storage backends ever on a IPFS subprocess based. Um, so IPFS source content immutably by its hash. Um, so I, 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 I read through the docs and quickly put together an IPFS-based storage backend. Um, so this is what this looks like. I would like to go just to cat parties, and I have a couple of images. And I don't need to you know, terminate with cat because I already got that. So if we just start with party, and I go to party cat, and I do save, then indeed you can see that this is now saved in my IPFS uh, backend. So I have an IPFS node running locally. Um, if you want to talk about crypto and blockchain, please do not ask any questions about it. But we can talk about it outside or over whatever we're doing later. <laughs> um, so questions. You mentioned earlier putting a, a content delivery network between your S3 object and um, the uh, people you're serving it to. Could you elaborate on that some more? Sure. So um, the general uh, principle, which I, I went over quickly, would be that you then, your, your links, um, you'd, you'd, you'd set a setting where your links, or your um, static URL, rather, is, is the, in the case of um, CloudFront, it would be like, you know, cloudfront.net slash whatever. Um, and so all of your links that would serve to the user would be those, would be links linking to CloudFront. So it, when you actually, when the user clicks or views or downloads, you know, loads that image tag or, or what have you, it would go to CloudFront. CloudFront would check its local cache. If it doesn't exist, it would go to your server and hit your server, which would return that, setting all sorts of nice caching headers saying, hey, CloudFront, since we've hashed this, you know, cache it for 30 years. Um, and then it, every time that that uh, request came back to, to, to CloudFront, it would already be there, so it wouldn't even have to go to your server. So thanks. Um, for uh, separating uh, media content, user uploaded media from the actual static files, does it also include uh, like PDF files or, or docs that user upload, you shouldn't save them or serve, save them on your own domain? Yeah, I mean, any, any user content, I would say, is, I mean, PDF file doesn't, it's really hard to validate a PDF file is a PDF file. You know, you could read, you could use libmagic to read the header, but just because it ends in PDF doesn't mean, doesn't mean anything, basically. And PDF is, is binary, right? It's not even. Okay, so, great talk, by the way. Thank you for that. Um, for media uploads, how do you stop, um, different users from uploading or overriding other users' files? Yeah, um, so it, de it depends. Um, it, there's a, for example, there, one of the um, API methods in that interface for storage is, is get available name. So in that, your storage backend could check, does this name exist? Maybe you want a user to be able to upload their own file. Um, in that case, I'd say you probably need some domain logic in front of it because, in that case, the business logic gets complicated. There's a there's a file, there's a setting to do this uh, at least in like the Bato backend, but it's just it's just changing get available name. Um, for a lot of files, for a lot of stuff, it's it's really nice for me to I'm able to like you know go down directories, so I use the um, upload to 
link, which can take a callback to say, like, hey, put it under this namespace, which I, you know, I don't let the user control. I say, oh, it's based on the user as ID, in which case it's almost like they have their own separate file thing. Um, there is some trickery, which is why it's always good to use a, a library where you could imagine someone could upload a file that starts with dot, 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 and then suddenly they're doing a directory traversal, and it's dangerous. Um, so yeah, that's why this sort of any user stuff, uh, sorry, security related stuff is usually not the best idea to write your own. I, I think there's too much like nobody should write it in the community, but I think it's, it really needs a lot of thought put into it. Do you have any recommended uh, patterns or best practices around access control of files that people upload? Yeah, so um, I just was, looking at this for, for a couple clients. Um, so for the cloud stuff, it's pretty normal um, to make you know, your, your bucket for an S3 uh, case is private by default, the ACL. And then you have to have um, signed URLs. Uh, but anyone with the signed URL, which you can include a timeout, can get it. Um, past that, you really end up having to do something where you put, because at that, Without that, you know, that's something that, that Amazon is mediating with you. I'm, I, I'm sure it exists for others, but Amazon is just the, inner, the provider I'm most familiar with. Um, past that, you end up having to just put your own view in front of it, which you know, it gets much slower, because then you need to do the logic yourself, then you need to fetch the file, and then you need to serve it. Um, whereas if it's coming directly from Amazon, you, know, you generate the link, you give the link to the user, and you, know, you, could, you could go to that directory until cows come home, if you don't have the, the, the hashed signed um, URL parameters, it doesn't matter. But there is, I mean, there is, you know, I have my users, uh, the links expire after an hour. I've already had multiple people say, hey, it's broken. I'm like, well, I could make it never expire, but then, you know, if the link gets out, it's never, it's not private anymore, or it depends on your trade offs that you're willing to, to look at. Any other questions? All right, thanks, Josh.